Well, let's check in with Zach Smith, legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation, who is also a former assistant U.S. District Attorney in Florida. Zach, welcome back. Now, take us through what happened today legally. Yeah, this is a standard part of the criminal process. After someone has been charged with a crime, formally indicted, as Donald Trump has been, they go for an arraignment where they learn about the charges against them officially, conditions of bail or pretrial release are set. Mm -hmm. And so this was all part of the standard process, but in a very uh, unprecedented manner. I mean, again, we've never before in our nation's history had a former president who's been indicted on criminal charges. And so even though arraignment is a standard part of any criminal process, uh, it took place in a very unprecedented case. And what did you think of the former president's decision to appear in court today rather than staying in Florida and fight the charges from there? Well, look, he's certainly entitled to appear in person as the defendant in the case. But I think what's important to keep in mind here, again, not only the unprecedented nature of the charge, but also how what we know about the charges, how they contrast with Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan District hmm. Attorney's usual stance on many criminal justice issues. Alvin Bragg came into office pledging not to prosecute many misdemeanors, pledging not to seek jail time, even for many repeat violent offenders. And based on the indictment we've seen, essentially Donald Trump is being accused of falsifying certain business records, which makes everyone wonder if the defendant's name wasn't Donald Trump, would Alvin Bragg have even pursued this case? Well, I think we know the answer to that. But uh, take us through these charges of the former president that he's facing. I mean, 34 charges. Yeah, that sounds like a lot, but it looks like, and I've only had time to briefly review the indictment, it looks like essentially each false business record, alleged false business record, uh, was listed as a separate charge. And again, I think it's important to keep in mind that based on what we know publicly, uh, the indictment itself wasn't very illuminating. It didn't really add much beyond what we already knew. But essentially, Donald Trump is being accused of falsifying business records and doing so with the intent to to conceal another crime. Now, the indictment doesn't list what that other crime is, uh, but there's wide speculation that it would be a potential federal campaign finance violation. Uh, and so it's odd that you would have uh, potentially a state court prosecution proceeding and being predicated on a federal campaign violation that the U.S. Department of Justice itself chose not to pursue. And, uh, you know, the media out there expected Donald Trump to make some sort of statement, but uh, he did not, I'm sure, at the advice of his attorneys. Tell us more about that. That's something that uh, anything he says could be used <laughs> against him, correct? Well, it can be. You know, that's part of the standard Miranda warnings <laughs> right. a criminal defendant gets. I don't think uh, Donald Trump has always heeded his lawyer's advice not to speak. <laughs> uh, and so I'm sure it was a welcome development in this case that he did. And I suspect we'll hear his side of the story, you know, if he gives a speech at Mar-a-Lago or in other places in a much more structured format. But look, I think it's important to realize, you know, an arraignment, it's a serious proceeding. Mm -hmm. It's certainly, even though these appear to be not novel charges being brought against him, uh, trumped up charges, some would say, uh, you know, it's still very serious and he is facing criminal liability. And so I think given that it was appropriate uh, in the way that he handled it there at the courthouse today. And we're almost out of time here, but what happens next? Talk to us about that. You know, what, how could this have any effect on the 2024 campaign? Uh, well, look, I think we're going to see a lot of pretrial litigation taking place. You know, one of the first things I suspect that Donald Trump and his lawyers will ask for is a change of venue. There's widespread speculation that he cannot get a fair trial in lower Manhattan. I think that uh, speculation is with some merit. And so I suspect we'll see a motion for change of venue. We'll see other pretrial motions as well. And we are a long way from the finish line in this case. And don't forget, there's still the federal case with the special counsel, Jack Smith as well as the case being potentially pursued by Democratic District Attorney Fannie Willis in Fulton County, Georgia, uh, there in Atlanta. And very quickly, Zach, uh, tell us about some of the other stories that you're following right now. 
Yeah, there's a lot going on in the Supreme Court. Uh, my colleague and I, we actually have a new book out. It'll be out on June 27th called Rogue Prosecutors, where we highlight many of the progressive prosecutors around the country, their disastrous policies, the disastrous consequences of those policies. And we actually have an entire chapter in the book devoted to Alvin Bragg. We talk about his wow. background, uh, the policies he's implemented, and again, the devastating consequences those policies have had on New Yorkers. We have to wait and see what those consequences are going to be, but Zach Smith, legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation, thank you so much for your insight. Of course, thank you for having me on.